Welcome back. So, let us now see how we can represent a, a stationary problem like the one that we have just described in the previous lecture in a compact and clean form. So, the way to do this is, is that we can dis draw a diagram of this kind. So, in this diagram here as this these big circles denote the state of the system. As, as you would recall the system can be in two different states in our problem. So, I have denoted these two states with these two circles S1 and S2. The, the, the actions that one can choose and the transition probabilities and the associated rewards are denoted by directed arcs between uh, between state uh, between this these two states. So, for instance I did I have a directed arc like this going from state S1 to state S2. Now, on top of this arc, this arc starts from S1 and goes to S2. On top of this arc, I will write the action that, that this arc represents. So, in this case, this arc represents the action A11. Below this, I, I write the reward that I would get and the probability with which this transition from S1 to S2 is going to occur. So, the reward here if you recall was 5 units from choosing action A11 in state S1. So, the reward here is 5 and the transition from S1 to S2 occurs with probability 0.5. Now, you would also remember that there is a, another possibility when one chooses action A11 in state S1 and that possibility is this that one can get one can stay back in state S1. So, this results in another arc that starts from S1 and ends at S1. Once again on top of this arc again I write that this is actually corresponding to action A11 and below the arc I have again the reward which was 5 units and the probability with which this, this transition occurs that is that is 0.5. Now, when I am in state S1, I also have another action possible that is the action A12. It takes me from state S1 to state S2. It gives me an, a reward of 10 units and it this transition occurs with probability 1. Right? When I am in state S2, I have only one transition, one action possible which is the action A21 and this action transitions me from S2 to S2 itself. It, in other words, it keeps me in state S2. This is the action A21. The reward that I receive for because of this is minus 1 and the transition from S2 to S2 itself happens with probability 1. So, that is written in these in these curly brackets here. Notice that this is a, this kind of a snapshot, uh, this, uh, this, this picture only represents a snapshot in time. It just tells you what is happening at when you do this at any instant in time. So, this would obviously be an accurate representation of the problem only, only if the, uh, if the problem actually was stationary means there was there were no uh, there, there were where the rewards and transition probabilities are independent of time. One of the other uh, thing elements that gets missing in a problem like uh, in a in a representation like this is what is actually the time horizon and then associated with that time horizon what is the terminal reward or the terminal cost that you are going to incur. So, in this case we are going to define these separately from this particular figure. This figure is going to see serve only as a as a way for us to uh, for us to understand what the transitions and the rewards are at any instant in time except for the terminal uh, except for the terminal time instant. So, the decision epochs for us are going to be therefore, 0, 1, 2 up until n minus 1 these are our decision epochs or stages. or stages or time time steps at which the decisions are being made. The, the states that we are in uh, uh, that the state system can be in are these S1, are S1 and S2. 
the actions that one can take are dependent on the state itself. So, A S 1 is the set of feasible actions in state S 1. So, A S 1 is A 1 1 A 1 2 A S 2 is the set of actions available in state S 2. So, that is A 2 1. The rewards are already written here, so let, but I will just write them here again for completeness. The reward at in state S1 when you take action A11 is 5, this reward when, when you I will just put the index T, but then we will for completeness here A. 1, 2 is 10, and this is true for all times t. And because we are assuming a finite horizon here, so here let me write here that n is less than infinity, I am going to I need to also define a terminal reward. The terminal reward here I am going to take for simplicity that this is the terminal reward regardless of the state you end up in is equal to 0. Finally, we have the transition probabilities, the transition probabilities P t of S1 given S1 comma A11 this is 0.5 Pt of of S2 given S1 comma A11 this is also equal to 0.5 Pt of S1 given S1 comma A12 is equal to 0, one does not transition to uh, uh, does not remain in state S1 at all when you take an action A12. Pt of S2 given S1 comma A12 is equal to 1 and Pt of S1 given S2 comma A21 this is equal to 0. So, when you take action A to 1 you remain in state S 2. So, this term is equal to 0 and P t of S 2 given S 2 comma A to 1 is equal to 1. This is your these are your transition probabilities. So, now let us write out the va uh, various types of policies. So, we will first do an example of a deterministic Markov policy. Now, in order to do this I need to define a decision rule at each at each time instant. So, if I have n time instants I need to define a, 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 a decision rule for each of those n time instants. So, obviously this can become very very uh, very very uh, long and laborious. So, we are going to take a very simple case we will take n equals 2. So, that means there will be only 2 decision epochs which is time 0 and time 1 and we will design deci define decision rules for those two decision epochs. So, we will take n equals 2 ok and let us write out these very a few a few policies. So, here is for example, a deterministic a deterministic Markov policy. Okay. Let us denote this by pi m d because this is Markov and deterministic, it is a particular policy. So, at so I have to write a decision rule for each time. For, for each decision epoch. So, at decision epoch 1, uh, 
Now uh, let us write the decision rule at decision epoch 1. Now at decision epoch 1 I have to define to define a decision rule at decision epoch 1 I have to define an action for each for each state that could potentially occur at decision epoch 1. So, the I have there are two possible states in this problem. So, I need to define an action for each of those two states ok. So, so since I am so actually this is uh, ok. So, since I am taking n equals 2 this is actually decision epoch 0 ok. So, this is at time equal to 0. So, here I am I am going to write so, at decision epoch 0 I need to define a decision rule that that defines an action for each of the states that can potentially potentially be realized at decision epoch 0. So, here is one such decision rule. So, I have d 0 d 0 let me write, put a superscript of Markov deterministic of S 1 equals a 1 1 and d 0 for Markov deterministic at state S 2 equals a 2 1. So, notice that the decision rule defines for for you an action for each state in the system uh, in the state space. The state space comprises of two states S 1 and S 2. So, it is telling you which action uh, you should choose in each of those states. The decision rule also has to be feasible means that it should specify for you an action which is actually available for, uh, for you to take at that at that instant uh, at that state. So, it is uh, here action A 1 1 is available at S 1. So, this uh, so it is ok to assign that in this uh, to this decision rule and action A 2 1 is the only action available at at state S 2. So, it you have to assign that in state S 2. Then let us move to decision epoch 2 or, deci or decision epoch 1 sorry. Once again I need to specify something that I would do in each state. So, here suppose I am in state if I am in state S 1 then what I would do is say let us say I take action A 1 2 and if I am in state S 2 then again I, I have no choice I have to take action A 2 1. So, again at decision uh, at so this should be D D 1. So, I again at state S 2 I have only action A 2 1 available with me. So, notice that these two function each of these lines here defines for me one decision rule. This is the function which maps S 1 to A 1 a 1 1 and S 2 to A 2 1. This is another function which maps S 1 to A 1 2 and S 2 to A 2 1. This is not the only possible decision rule. Obviously, there are many other decision rules which are also Markov and deterministic. For example, I could have taken instead of taking action A 1 1 here, I could have taken action A 1 2 here or instead of taking action A 1 2 here I could have taken action A 1 1 here again. All of these are possible variations or different types of different or different Markov decision rules or and therefore, collectively they define a Markov decision deterministic Markov policy ok. All of this is just one example of a Markov decision deterministic Markov policy. Let us now look at a mark a randomized a randomized Markov policy. So, once again at decision epoch 1 So, at decision epoch 1 and at decision uh, sorry at decision epoch 0 and at decision epoch 1 
I need to specify what exactly is my policy going to be doing or my decision rules going to be doing. So, this is now a randomized Markov policy. So, it will take uh, as argument the state that you are in and it will produce as its output a probability distribution on the set of actions in such a way that it, uh, it respects the constraints that the actions only the actions that are available are getting positive probability uh, can get positive probability. Okay. So, here is one pot potential randomized Markov policy. For example, one could do Q. So, let me define directly the probability distribution that the policy is going to induce the probability distribution on the set of actions. So, here for example, Q F Q So, this is this notation here stands for the probability distribution of a deterministic Markov decision rule at time 0 ok at time 0. Now, this has to be this must uh, I need to define this has to be a probability distribution. So, it has to give me a probability for every possible every possible action that is available at that uh, in that uh, in a particular state. So, here for example, so I need to write this for every state that can occur at time at uh, at decision epoch 0. So, suppose if the state is S 1 then and if then the probability of taking action A 1 1 in state S 1 under this decision rule is given by this particular expression here which is Q, Q sub D M R 0 of S 1 of A 1 1. Now, suppose this this quantity suppose is 0 0.7. So, what this says is that with probability 0 0.7 I am going to be I am going to be taking action A 1 1 when I am in state S 1 according to this particular policy. So, if I I can I have another action available at when I am in state S 1. So, that so, this policy for it to define a valid probability distribution must give the remaining probability to that action. So, it should take action A 1 2 with probability 0 0.3 when in state S 1 at time 0. Now, this only defines for me the probability distribution on the actions when I am in state S 1. Okay, in order for me to completely define the uh, a, a randomized Markov policy, I need to also tell you what I'd be doing in state S2. So, in state S2, the same D0 of D0 MR at state S2 takes action A21 with what probability? What should be this probability? Well, if you see, there is only one action available at in state S2. So, naturally one you have to take that particular action with probability 1. So, this has to be equal to equal to 1. So, any randomized Markov policy must satisfy this particular um, uh, this particular uh, this, uh, this particular formula here because it there is really no choice when you are at state S2. Okay. Now, let us go to decision epoch 1. So, at decision epoch 1 I now have suppose the uh, the decision rule is D 1 M R. Suppose I am in state S 1 and again I, I have to tell you with what probability I am going to be taking various actions. So, I am going to take action A 1 1 say with probability 0 0.4 and I take action A 1 2 with the remaining probability which is 0 0.6. This is at decision epoch 1. Then uh, 
I have to also tell you what I would be doing in state S2. Well, in state S2 again I have since I have no choice, I have I have to take action A to 1 with probability 1. All of this defines for me a probability distribution on the set of actions for every state. Clearly there can be multiple such probability distributions. For in here I have chosen point, point 0.7 and point 0.3 as the probabilities of choosing actions A11 and A12. They need not be these numbers. I could have for example another probability distribution is where this is 0.25 and this is 0.75 for or this one is 0.3 and this is 0 0.7 etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. There are many such probability distributions. Each such distribution defines for you a randomized Markov policy. Okay. Each such so for every state I have a distribution and ev and every different once you change the distribution at any one state you get a new type new a new randomized Markov policy. Let us now uh, let us now consider what happens to this problem. Uh, when, let us now write out history dependent policies. Now, in order to write out history dependent policies, one we have to notice something rather peculiar about about this particular problem. Now, here when you are in state S1, when you are in state S1, what is the way you could have potentially, what is the history that could have led you to state S1? Suppose at some time instant you are in state S1, then what is the history that could have led you to state S1? Well, if you see there is not much uh, there is not much variation possible here. The reason is that if you are in state S1, then the only way you could you are presently in state S1 was if you were previously in state S1 and took action A11. Right? So, the only way you can presently be in state S1 is if you had in the previous step take if in the previous step also you were in state S1 and you took action A11. Now, I am not saying that every time you take action A11 you will end up in state S1 because there is a chance for you to transition to probability to state S2 as well. So, if you take action A11 in state S1 you could move to state S2, but the only way you could end up in S1 is by taking a action A11, right. So, if you are presently in if your current state is S1 then your so state at say time t is S1 then the state at time S uh, time t minus 1 should also be S1 and the action at time t minus 1 should have been A11. But then if the state at time t minus 1 is S1, then the time the state at time t minus 2 should have also been S1 and the action at time t minus 2 was also A should have also been A11 and so on. So, in other words because there is really only one way to, to get to state S1 it means it has to be that you have always been in state S1. If you are presently in state S1, you have always been in state S1. What this essentially tells you is that the present state, the present state of being in S1 actually is also telling you thanks to the structure of the problem is also telling you the history of states and actions that have occurred so far. So, if you are presently in state S1, then you have previously been in state S1 for all the times and have always taken action A11 at all of those time instants. So, as a result, th therefore, as a result, there is really no additional information that is present in the history up until any time t if you are presently in state S1. When you are presently in state S1, that state itself tells you the entire history that is present. As a result of this, there is no difference between history dependent policies, history dependent decision rules at time S1 
and his and and Markov decision rules at time at time s1. So every Markov decision rule can uh, is can be thought of without loss of generality uh, uh, when it is acting at state s1 can be thought of without loss of generality as a history dependent decision rule because the information in the in the state is uh, is enough to conclude for us to conclude the entire history. What happens when we are in state S2? When we are in state S2, the matter, the, uh, the, the situation is a little different. When we are in state S2, the, uh, now S, you, could, you could come to state S2 in many different ways. You could, uh, you could have been in S2 previously and taken action A21 or you could have been in state S1 and taken action A11 or you could have been in S1 and taken action A12. All these th three possible histories are valid when, when uh, valid ways of reaching state S2 at any given time. So being in state S2 does not actually help you conclude what the previous history has been. The, the way we could conclude the entire history from uh, being in state S1, being in state S2 does not help us conclude the entire history. However, being in state S2 does help us, uh, does have another consequence which is that there is no other action apart from A21 that one can take. So regardless of whether you know the history or not, regardless of whether you have the information of the history or only the present state when your uh, present state S2, you can only take action A21 in state S2. As a result of this, um, once again, the set of uh, whether you have the history or not, you have you are effectively compelled to take only one particular decision rule when you are in state when you end up in state S2. Whether you know the history or not, you have to choose action A21. As a result of this, once again, for uh, for a different reason, the set of decision rules that uh, that you can apply when you are in state S2 is with the history or without the history is the same because you have only one action. So the consequence of this is that if you look at, if you, if you ask what is the set of history dependent policies in this particular problem, well in this problem the set of history dependent policies is in fact equal to the set of Markov, Markov policies. The, and the, in this it does not matter whether these are, whether the policies are deterministic or randomized. If you have a, a history dependent randomized policy, it can be implement, it can be equivalently thought of as an, as a, as a randomized Markov policy. If you have a history dependent deterministic policy, it has, it can be equivalently thought of as a Markov deterministic policy. In other words, there is no further richness or no further information available in knowing the history in this particular problem. Now this is obviously a coincidence in this particular problem that is because of the structure of the problem the and it has obvious, I have obviously chosen this problem in order to make this particular point clear to you that there can be times when you do not benefit from knowing the history. Now what we will do is in the next lecture we will actually look at a variation on this problem in which certain uh, we will add another action at, at uh, state S1 and in that case we will see that knowing the history and not knowing the history can lead you to very different type of policies, very different policies altogether. Okay? This will be in the next lecture.